Conan, what is best in life? To crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and to hear the lamentation of the women. That is good. That is good. Bam here with the Flying Monkeys Wargaming Podcast, where Wargaming was easy with me and mom. And this episode, we have Jim Vessel. Jim comes on and we talk a little bit about uh, influencers and coaching services and community members out there getting previews, what it means, what kind of advantages it gives, uh, are they paid working for Games Workshop, etc., etc. We, uh, we get all around it, and uh, the positives, the negatives, and uh, a lot of the negatives. So I think we're both down on this in a lot of ways. But it is what it is. So you can agree with us, you cannot agree with us, you can give us feedback. Always at flymonkeyswargaming at gmail.com. And uh, I do think Jim has a pretty good take on it. And a pretty interesting perspective on this as far as being a business owner, how he handles customer service, etc., etc. So it's a good listen. So I hope you enjoy the episode. Uh, let me know. And uh, I will shut up and get into it. Flying Monkeys Wargaming Podcast, where Wargaming was easy, it would be your mom. Your main host, Bam, here, and a special guest today. Some of you guys know him because uh, Ryan uh, ran towards the top of the ITC with a chaos list for a while. A hell of a painter. Uh, Jim Vessel, what's happening, man? Hey, dude, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Not too bad, not too bad. I appreciate you coming on today. Uh, the reason I got Jim on is uh, both of us, you know, I've kind of read some of Jim's comments online about a topic. And I wanted to pick his brain a little bit because I think he made some good points. And I wanted to talk about him on the podcast. Uh, basically, so, you know, there's kind of a phenomenon lately with Games Workshop uh, previewing products, releasing products early, uh, getting it out to influencers. One of which we are not involved in at all. So I don't think I uh, I don't get any previews, teasers, anything like that. And I'm pretty sure uh, I don't think you do either, do you, Jim? Nope, nothing like yeah. that. No, Which is fine. I, I I don't accept any sort of sponsorships on the content I do. So, yeah, and I I don't really know what I would even do if I got it at the time. Uh, I do think it's cool for some people that you know make fun review or you know content, getting it out there so people can see what's coming in the pipes and be excited about it. But there's a uh, you know there's kind of some talk on the internet out there lately of uh, people who make their living off of 40k or people who make their living doing coaching services. Um, having access to play test stuff and having access to uh, early product, and that's kind of what brought us here today. Uh, did, I, did I phrase that right? Are you got anything to add or take away there, Jim? Yeah, no, I think that I think that sums it up. I think um, I think the kind of cer- the current kind of I guess pipeline of influencer content creator to Games Workshop to reviewer is is is, is uh, and play testers. That whole kind of ecosystem is extremely problematic in a lot of ways, and I, I don't think. I don't think there's enough happening from the content creators, and I don't think there's enough happening from the community to push back on it. So, so what do you mean? Uh, there's not enough happening from the content creators? Can you can you expand so, on that? Yeah. So okay. So so I'll use a, I'll use a different industry as a as a as an analogy. So I uh, I follow. I don't know if you follow uh, tech like tech at all, or uh, like like g- gaming tech, or if you follow movies. Or if you follow, uh, let's say, video games, like uh, gaming reviews. So okay. in all of these industries, <clears throat> you have reviewers, right? So, so you know, I, well, I guess the first thing I would say is no one's saying is that no one's saying that no one should review these products and that no one should have them in advance. I, I don't think that's a realistic expectation. And in fact, I don't think that's beneficial for the community to create an ecosystem where everyone has to wait till day of to figure out if that's a purchasable thing. So we want... We want someone a week in advance to tell us, hey, is this good or bad, right? Like we want the uh, embargoes and the NDAs to be lifted a little bit ahead of time so that we can assess the product, whether it's 
a Games Workshop codex or whether it's a piece of hardware or whether it's a movie that we're going to go see, we want to read those reviews and figure out, is this a good thing or bad thing and should I spend my money on it? So I don't think there's anyone arguing against that whole concept. I think that's something that, for the consumer, is really important because it gives us better good information and it helps us spend our money in a better way. So I just want to make that really clear. I think, yeah, I, think I, the- I do think it I do think it helps us as a community make a more educated decision as far as if we want to pick something up or not because it is not a cheap hobby. It's a pretty expensive hobby for most folks. And having that stuff out there, you know, ahead of time can help you make that decision and pull the trigger at your shop or not. And also I, the the secondary to that which you didn't really touch on but me, because I, I own a store, so I have to disclaim that I own a game store. You know, so I it helps me gauging interest in community members as far as how much I should order things. Mm-hmm. And like chapter approved, they they talked about the new chapter approved in the mission pack last Saturday, I believe. And I got back to work, and I got back to work. I already had emails from people wanting to pre order the book, and the book doesn't technically go on pre order till Saturday. So that tells me that, like, okay, there's a lot of hype generated around this. I probably need to order to support the hype, take care of my customer base. And so it helps keep me informed in that way. And uh, I think where I run into the problem, and I might differ than you on this in, in theory, is, like, let's let's go back to Cursed City. Um, are you on Sigmar at all? Or are you pretty much 40K guy? Are you... Uh, I'm painting vampires right now, okay. but it turns out they're not actually that good. So uh, I'm definitely I'm definitely kind of slowly painting a little bit of Sigmar, and I'm gonna take a, probably another look at it with uh, with Eros three. So, um, but yeah, I, I don't have a. I mean, I have a demon army, so I could probably run a, 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 a lot of Sigmar, and I have a Bellacor. So still yeah. trying to figure out what I want to do, but I, I could probably I could probably play it. Hey, hey, you guys, and if you have not, you need to go look at uh go look at Jim's Bellacor. On uh, on the Instagram, it's uh, it's pretty dope. I think GW even shared it, didn't they? No, it's actually funny because I've had like two or three posts go like crazy viral on like Twitter and Instagram, where I've had like two thousand plus retweets and likes, and I've never had and I've I've tagged Warhammer Community and all those things, and and I've never had them reach out to be like, hey, because you know that you always see those people where it's like, hey, we like your model, we'd like to feature it. They've never yeah. reached out, so maybe I'm already in the on the blacklist. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So regardless, <laughs> it's a, he's got the dopest looking Bellacore I've seen so far. So you need to go find it online. It's not hard to find. Um, so the point I was trying to get to was, you know, like rewinding the Curse City. You know, they allocated most stores uh, to eight. You know, my store got eight boxes of Curse City, and I have friends who own stores who who never even got their curse city you know or their curse city wasn't going to arrive till down the road and you know the week before you know it seemed like there's you know three dozen four dozen freaking influencers on the youtube cracking open their curse city boxes and uh, one of the comments we had you know talking about store stuff was like you know they probably could have fulfilled three or four stores if they wouldn't have sent those out to influencers and you know so i don't know what the magic number is or how you even delegate it or how you even thin down who should or shouldn't be getting the stuff um what do, what do you think about that what kind of standards should you have or how should they go about that if you if you ruled the world what would you do um as far as choosing how to get that out there because you seem to be a big fan of previews and, and mm-hmm. letting the community know what's going on how would you dial that down or how would you make those decisions well i think yeah so it's, it's a you know it's a very complicated issue with a lot of different pieces to it so i, I and just kind of going back to what i said i think there is a benefit and i think we can both agree there is a benefit for cons- for for uh, let's call them content creators. I'm just gonna use that as a ubiquitous term to cover anyone that might get these copies ahead of event reviewers, whatever you want to call them. There is a benefit for the community to get these ahead of time for the community, right? And you know, ultimately, when we probably look at the total number of cursed city boxes that were given to content creators, you know, let's say it was maybe a hundred, you know, because I didn't see, I don't think there's more than a hundred preview copies sent out right there may obviously be more than 100 reviews on youtube from people that went and purchased them themselves and reviewed them but there's probably not more than 100 that's and i think that's generous 100 um i don't even know if there's 100 like full-time content creators so in the grand scheme of the like total amount of cursity boxes made it probably didn't actually make a big dent like it didn't really move the needle a lot but i think the issue is you know so, so i think the issue specifically and, and cursity is a bit of a unique case because of the fact that like you know, are we? It, it is kind of deviating from the bigger topic, which is the 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 kind of that pipeline of advanced copies and that kind of like that that level of like I guess um, that relationship with Curse City specifically. I think it was a case of obviously dishonest. I want to. I'm gonna say dishonest because 
if it was accidental, there wouldn't have been a, there would have been an apology. There would have been an admission of a mistake. There would have been a hey guys, we know we screwed this up. We're sorry. Um, obviously, this is what happened. This is kind of like our mess up. So, in the absence of that, and we never got anything from Games Workshop saying hey guys, we screwed this up. We uh, you know we said it was going to be a mainline game. It was going to be a full stock range, and the cr- information was incorrect or whatever. In fact, because they went and scrubbed all their old posts, it shows a t- intent. Right? It shows malicious intent to actually go and kind of scrub their old information. So in this specific case of Curse City, I can only presume that something was done intentionally here. Now, who made that decision? Whether it was the community guys themselves, obviously I doubt it. I doubt they're in on it, quote unquote. But I bet you at some point, some suit somewhere decided that this was going to be the decision. And instead of being honest with the community about it, they were dishonest and still have been dishonest to this day and that resulted in a lot of you know sad people and still to this day if you go to any of the gw previews or any of the warhammer community on twitch things is literally cursed city being spammed in there i'm surprised they haven't actually banned the word on twitch so with cursed city i i, I guess i want to differentiate cursed city because i do think it's a bit of a unique case it's a, it's a little bit of a different case of what what i'm concerned about which is the influencer uh the content creator games workshop relationship um and i ultimately do think that it was good that those guys got copies at the end of the day, would it have would it have made a difference if if they didn't get any copies? Yeah, yeah maybe like maybe six, you know, a hundred more people would have gotten a copy. Um, so I don't think it was the end of the world. I do know though, and, and I'm sure I don't know if you experienced this. I do know, and I and I understand they've renamed their allocation to caps uh, yeah. because <laughs> because allocation gives the uh, intent that they're basically giving you a certain minimum amount. Where actually they're now caps for the stores to order instead of alloc- being allocated. But from my understanding, the biggest issue was the fact that they allowed stores to pre-sale way more than they were actually willing to give. So uh, from, a, from an actual project and business management standpoint, if I say to you, <clears throat> this is, and this is, I, you know, I run a business, I have, I have five restaurants. If I make a commitment to my guests and say, hey, I'm going to do this thing, if I screwed it up, no matter what it takes, I'm going to honor that. I'm going to figure out a way to honor it for you. Right. And so if I say, hey, you can have 50 copies of Curse City to your retail store, and you sell 50 pre-orders, you take money for 50 pre-orders, and I say, oh, actually, you only get eight? Well, that's on you. That's not on the retail store. So you need to do something to fix this, not me. And if that means, you know, you need to sweeten the deal and make it up somehow for me, or you need to reprint Curse City, and it might take five months, but that's what you're going to do, whatever it takes. And even if you maybe you can't reprint Curse City, the, the mold shattered and exploded and we'll never see it again, well, then you need to do something to make it right for me, right? You need to make me whole again as a retailer. So that's something that, you know, when our guests, one of my guests have an issue, there's, 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 a, there's a matter of integrity for me that even if uh, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure that they're taken care of and that they understand that I do care that, you know, we, we give them a bad experience or whatever. And so, you know, whatever that takes, right? So Even, even if you have to eat it a little bit, you know? Even if it's... you have to eat it. And, you know, Games Workshop is, look, for every, for every here's what I would have done. For every Curse City, like, and this, this sounds crazy, but this is what I've done. For every games or every curse city that you pre-ordered but didn't get, I would have I would have paid you the, the I would have written you a check for the amount of dollars that you lost because we couldn't fulfill those orders. And Games Workshop has a five billion five five billion with a B not a five billion euro market cap company in the UK stock exchange. They're the, one of the largest, I think, top three companies in, in the in the UK. So and they make hundreds of billions of hundreds of millions, sorry, of profit every year in, in British pounds. This is and euros or whatever the currency they trade in, but this is not a company that is struggling. This is not your mom and pop store. Right. So, so anyways, that's a whole that's a whole thing, and I, I, I could talk a whole episode on that. But I yeah, guess so going, let's get into the yeah. I guess the meat and potatoes. What we really were going to talk about was, uh, like you you mentioned the term earlier. I think you said full time content creators. Um, I'm I'm not sure if you would call that if you would lump it in the same thing. But a lot of guys out there now are making livings, making a living off of 40k. For lack of a better way to put it, they their full time work is 40k. Um, you know, they're streaming games, playing 40k. They're doing previews. They're writing articles. They're doing coaching services, and uh, you know, basically, those people are getting access to content early. You know, which kind of, in my opinion, leads to some some unfair advantages over everybody else in the market. You know, if if you're if you're Income comes from, you know, writing lists, helping people with coaching, get ready for tournaments, preparing for tournaments, and you know things are in the works, or you know things in the pipes, you know, that whole insider info thing is how it feels to me. 
And uh, you could probably, I think you articulated a little bit better than that where I saw in one post that you made today. Uh, do you want to expound on that? What are your thoughts or where, where are you coming from in, in regards to this? So, okay, so I guess, you know, for me, it doesn't really matter if you're a, con- a full-time or part-time or if you're doing it professionally or not. What matters to me is that <clears throat> if, you're, if you're getting a monetary benefit from the preview copies, right? So you're getting an advanced copy, which you are. And I, when I say monetary benefit, I don't mean you got a forty, uh, you know, in Canada or sixty dollars. I don't mean the monetary benefit of sixty dollars of a codex. That's not what I mean by monetary benefit. What I mean by is, if you run a channel, say on Twitch or on YouTube, and it, which is monetized, and the content you create on that channel uh, generates income, and by having a preview copy, so say I get my uh, Admet codex a week in advance, I'm able to put up a video on day one. And that video generates income for me. Well, then the value of that codex is not sixty dollars. It's actually the the amount of money that is created on that content. So if I can create a battle report, a review, and one other piece of content, say I create three videos from this this preview copy that go on live day one, and say you know whatever money those generate, whatever dollars those generate, that is how much Games Workshop is paying me by giving me that codex. So there is a there is a direct relationship. There's a monetary benefit for that reviewer from Games Workshop. That is the cost of the codex plus any monetary benefit that they gain from producing that content. And so if you're a, a content creator that uh, has a, a, a whose channels are monetized, which almost all of these full-time guys are, and some of the part-time ones are as well, um, then you're, you're getting paid by Games Workshop for an exchange of services which is the review which is to which is marketing essentially you're essentially marketing for games workshop and if so does you that make at, you a shill or does that make sorry? you does that make you a shill because well, so you here's the that- thing so here here's the big issue with this and here's ultimately where for me i think it's problematic so going back to my example earlier of um and, and i'll use something very simple um so in, in in the video card if you bought a video card in the last 30 years it's either been from nvidia or it's been from AMD, who makes um, like their, their cards. Now, if I review video cards for a living, AMD sends me cards, and NVIDIA sends me cards, and all the board partners send me cards. If they're bad, if the benchmarks are bad, I can say that they're bad, because I don't, I'm not reliant on... like I can be honest about my review with that product without any fear of NVIDIA saying, you know what, we don't like that you gave our card a negative review because the, you know, it wasn't good enough. So we're never going to send you a card again, and we're going to lose, uh, you're going to lose that income. Games Workshop, because it is a monopoly, and because they are so, um, they are so careful about who, how they are perceived, you are, not, you are not able to, as a content creator, come, like, look at even, look at all of the reviews you cannot say something is bad. So it's not it's not necessarily a case of, um, hey, here's a video from Games Workshop. This is a paid advertisement by Games Workshop. I'm going to be really transparent. This codex is bad. Do not buy it. Do you think if any of these guys that got books said, say, for instance, the Space Souls book or any of the books that haven't been great, right. or if they got any of the other products, if they said, this is a bad book, do not purchase this book. It is It is bad. Or the Warhammer app is bad or the XYZ, insert whatever product you think Games Workshop has made in the last, the Kill Team box, right, with the intercessors. This is really bad value. Do not purchase this. This is a, this is a, a you know, ripoff. Do you think any of those content creators said that honestly about their products, that Games Workshop would continue to send them products? No, I've never, I've never seen it. You know, like, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm an it, avid Space Wolves player. You can yeah. tell by the background I got up here. And, uh, you know, I, I've got, I've been playing Space Wolves since 1994, you know, and and I have, you know, this book, when I read it, I was, I was so mad. I was disappointed because the index was better than the codex. But when I was watching all these previews where the guys were talking about the books, talking about the book, talking about the books, and guys that I think are decent players, you know, that know how the game works, knows what the competitive scene's all about, you know... You and I, I've seen you at LVO, you know, we, we hit big GTs all the time. You know, guys that know better were reviewing that book and talking about how cool it was. You know, not one person came back and said, like, this leaves a little be desired. This is lackluster. You know, it seems like it was minimal effort, blah, 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 whatever. If I were to read that book, um, from the index that they put out was better than the codex that they put out. 
and and nobody dared even broach that subject and i think everybody knew you know but again like you said if they if they come out and say this codex supplements trash you know they they lose the golden goose in a certain way right and, and, so, and so you're not you're not getting unbiased information right. anymore and unlike for instance the video games like a video game reviewer who's going to be getting video games potentially uh, preview copies from say 40 different publishers right or the the video card reviewer that's going to get uh, continue to get them from N- like he can say bad things about Nvidia because AMD exists, right? Intel and and AMD same thing, right? Like look at movies. Movies come out constantly, and if you're a film critic, film critics film critics are famous for for saying movies suck. That's like one of their like defining things. Like go to Rotten Tomatoes, go to like any sort of film reviewer. I'd say about like fifty percent of the re- movies that they review, they say they're not good, right? But do they continue to get press access? Do they continue to get access to uh, press screenings? Of course they do, because that is how the industry works. It is, it is, there is an understanding that, that there's this transparency within that industry to a point, obviously. Now, with Games Workshop, even, look, and I'm not saying that they should come out and say, this is, this is, this is garbage, don't ever buy this. But how can I, as a consumer, you or anyone that's listening, when I read a review, let's say, and I'm going to pick on someone, um... Let's say, uh, like, I mean, we're talking about today, so let's say the Art of War guys. Now, they don't actually get previews, so let's not use them. Let's use um, Tabletop Titans, right? So okay. they are, they are. I think uh, Brian uh, is a playtester, I believe. Brian Pullen? I've he's heard rumors he is, but yeah, I Yeah, so from what I understand, I he's a playtester, and I know he's a playtester because he's said it as much. Yeah. Um, and so he's not only a content creator with his channel, but he's also a playtester. So when they review a book, when they come up with a video content for that book... How how much can I trust as a consumer that what they're telling me is straight, it's honest, and it's their 100% transparent and honest take? I can't, right? And the, the other thing is is that whole relationship, like they don't they don't um, they don't disclose at the start of the video. Hey guys, this is a paid advertisement for Games Workshop, right? So in a lot of different um, areas industries, when you create an ad and it's sponsored, quote unquote sponsored. Not only do you have to declare, especially on YouTube and, and Instagram, actually, there's actually a box that you're supposed to check if you're creating advertised content. And no, none, of, none of the content creators do that. So they don't disclose. They, they kind of treat it like it's not a paid relationship where they're not actually getting paid by Games Workshop to, to review these things, which they are. And so I think that's problematic because as a consumer, how am I supposed to have trust in those reviewers that they're... They're giving me their honest, 100% straight opinion, and they're saying it with integrity, and they're saying it unfiltered, and they're not holding back their true thoughts because they're worried if they are too honest, they're going to lose that golden goose, right? Yeah, and and I don't know if Games Workshop, like you talked about, they're really, they're image conscious, and, and sure. they're too image conscious, to be honest. I, I think they could honestly put together a better product sometimes if they would take legitimate feedback from the community in a way that's not... I don't know how to explain it. Like, uh, you know, the, the, we've always heard the term ivory tower in regards to them. Like, they, they retreat to the ivory tower. Uh, they don't communicate with their with their fan base in a lot of ways. And they just kind of push things out and tell you this is how it is. And, and there's no interaction. And and I think the, the problem is with the, I think the way that they do it now is it's almost like a, it, it's like a false interaction. Because it, it's, they pretend like they're interacting with you through these people doing the reviews when really they, you know, could snatch that away from them at any time. If they said something that went against their image conscious way of doing things. And and that's where I guess that's what bothers me probably a lot about it is, is a company should be able to say like, here's my product. It stands on its own. Um, You know, and if, if reviewers come out and say like, this is trash, they go back to the drawing board and try to do better. You know, like, you know, popular mechanics, I don't know if you're into cars or not, but for years, like, popular mechanics would, like, trash new cars, you know, or they would mm-hmm. talk about how great a new car is. And instead of, like, the the automobile companies saying, like, I'm not going to let popular mechanics review my car anymore, you know, they would try to do better and see if they could get some kind of cool review out of it. And, like, you're probably the same way. You know, some some dude came by your restaurant and reviewed some new dish you had. And he was a he was accredited in, in I guess having the experience or the 
the authority to make those kinds of statements about a dish and he told you it was trash, what would you do? Would you go back to the drawing board or would you tell him yeah, he's an like, asshole and just be I done mean, with no, it? No, like we, we take every bit of feedback uh, to heart and we take it very seriously because ultimately the customers are who we serve, right? And, th- you know, that actually brings up a really good point. When you, when you look at one of these content creators, you have to ask yourself, who are they there for? So when they do a review, who are they doing it for? They're not doing it for the customer. They're doing it for Games Workshop because Games Workshop is paying them to do it. So when you read a review, just remember, or and when you watch a review, just remember that that is not a review that a content creator is doing for your benefit as the consumer. They are doing it because Games Workshop has paid them to do it through product and through exposure of the content. So who do they work for? They work for Games Workshop, right? Now, is that a bad thing? No, that's not a bad thing inherently. And I think, but the problem is this lack of transparency and this kind of veneer that actually, here's these guys that just really care about uh, being honest and transparent and they're going to tell you the truth when we all know that that's, that's total bullshit. Like that's not, sorry if I'm not supposed to swear on this podcast. Dude, but, um, I, I don't know if you ever listen, but we... <laughs> We, we have we're Millie Mouth bastards. Dude. Okay, we're all so like time. that that if if you if you're gonna sit there with a straight face and say that you can be completely honest and open about a product that Games Workshop sent you with no fear of repercussion from their office, I, I'll call you a liar because I know for a fact people who have had those relationships severed by Games Workshop due to the fact that they have been too outspoken, they have been too truthful, they have been too honest, and when you know when they say that hey this stinks. They've gotten to a lot of grief. And the other thing, to your to your, to your, um, to your point, the reason Games Workshop doesn't care is because of hubris, right? Like, they are the number one miniature manufacturer with them, uh, in the world, not by a little bit, but by leagues, right? Exponentially. They are exponentially bigger than the next closest person. And so they, they actually don't care, and they don't need to care, right? And that's, that's ultimately the problem. So where, where we can affect change, I think, is at a consumer level, and is to bring light to these issues because I think, um, you know, if you look at the history of Games Workshop, obviously in the last five or six years, their community engagement has gotten a lot better. I'm sure you remember the the Dark Ages when basically they didn't talk to anyone. They had no for- uh, after they closed down their forums. I think in like early 2003, 2004, there was about a 10, 15 year period where they just literally like didn't talk to anyone, did whatever the fuck they wanted, and their and their profits reflected that right and then slowly they started to kind of turn things around and obviously they've gotten a lot better in a lot of ways but when it comes to like have they done have they done something bad or something wrong that's still an area where they don't take feedback very well and they don't take it to heart because if you look at things like the warhammer app you know um the the way that was released and the feedback was generally like atrocious has been generally panned but because there's enough people in the games workshop ecosystem it kind of feels like it like you know we're addicted because of that monopolistic approach even if they release a bad codex you know we're so invested as a as a as a customer base they have us they have us like hook line sinker and it's really hard to walk away it's really hard to say like you know with with a, with a video game i could say you know what i don't want to play this i'm not going to buy from this publisher anymore and there's a thousand other video games i could go play Right. If I don't okay. like what AMD is doing, if I don't like what AMD is doing, I can go buy Nvidia. If I don't like what, uh, if I don't like a movie, I can put a bad review on it, and then I never go see a movie from that director again. Very easily. If I don't like something Games Workshop's doing, for me to leave the community, the hobby, and all that stuff, and go play, say, War Machine, or go play Legion, or go play any other games, that is like, that is like the dis- the difference between me going outside and me going to the moon. The amount of like to change your entire hobby ecosystem over say your dissatisfaction with a product is incredibly difficult. So there's this gravity that Games Workshop has that kind of holds you in there and it holds you really tight and you have to get to the very, very bitter end of your kind of cynicism and uh, be willing to give up your entire community of friends, your entire community of gaming people that you've probably spent five, 10, 15 years with so that you can make a principled stance and that's really fucking hard. Like that's yeah. really fucking hard. Sometimes you just, you know what, you kind of, you, you just, you just suck it up, and you're like, you know what, yeah, this sucks, but all my friends are playing this, and, um, like, I guess I'm just gonna keep playing. I'm just gonna keep doing what I can. Yeah, and see, and that's my thing is like, I, I talk to my fiance sometimes, and you know, we had a discussion a couple years ago 
I, I've always thought of myself as a Star Wars guy, and I see the Yoda on your wall, you know, and signed and, by Frank Oz too. Yeah, and and uh, I actually met Frank Oz once. It was a super nice. cool experience. Uh, but you know, you I've always thought of myself as a Star Wars guy. You know, growing up, I love Star Wars. I was a big, huge Star Wars action figures, all kinds of stuff. And one day I was telling her you know, that I thought, you know, I'm a Star Wars guy as far as like a geekdom's concerned, and and she's like, you know, I, I, I you know, I don't know if you've thought about this, but you're you're definitely a Warhammer guy first, and then you're a Star Wars guy second. Mm-hmm. And I'd never really stopped and thought about it, but like my house was filled with like I have more Warhammer books than I do Star Wars books. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got I'm looking at a shelf in front of me with you know Space Wolves miniatures all over it, posters prints out of box sets, you know, and I have a display case in my living room with a full-size Space Marine helmet, you know, and Space Wolves models in it, and I got a garage full of miniatures, I got a closet full of miniatures, you know, look at you, you've got, you know, books, shelves, all the stuff in your room right now is predominantly Warhammer. I have an entire sleeve of Star Wars tattoos, by the way. (laughs) So I'm also a Star Wars guy, but the thing is, my Star Wars, I can be a Star Wars fan, and it can be like, I can watch the movies and read the read, watch the shows, and that's like the extent of my investment. Like I don't need to play the games. I don't need to like you yeah. know. Uh, I I, I stop trying to keep track of the new canon, like in the books. Um, you know, but I, I still watch all the shows, like Clone Wars, Bad Batch, like Mandalorian. Like I'm all into that. Yeah, but I don't collect any of the toys or anything like that. So like my Star Wars fandom is much different than my 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 Warhammer fandom, right? It's very two different things. But the thing is, like all my friends like Star Wars, and we can enjoy it without like. It, it, it it's kind of like a almost like a passive fandom right there's not much that's i true. do there i just kind of like it and that's it like i don't need to uh and then there's things that i don't like right like you know a lot of people always ask me if i like the new movies and i have mixed, very mixed feelings on them right so um but i like them because they're, they're star wars like there's a part of me that likes them because they're star wars and anything star wars i like but as a movies maybe i don't like them anyways not getting sidetracked i can, yeah. I can have a whole episode on the stars movies well but, and um, it's and I guess the point I was trying to make is when you talked about like taking that stand or stepping away from the, you know, what your friends are doing, you know, for someone like me that, you know, a lot of my internal fantasy or my internal, you know, fiction that I love is wrapped up in this universe. It's wrapped up in this product and this IP that only James Workshop, James Workshop can put out, you know, so what, what do you do then? You know, do you, you just yeah. throw it away and walk away from it, or what, when's enough enough for some people? And I've spent, I you know, I've spent enough on Warhammer to put myself like, like I have, I haven't spent that much on Star Wars to be honest. Yeah, compared <laughs> to Warhammer. Um, but anyways, I, I guess back to the point is like, so because of the fact that ga- the Games Workshop ecosystem is so tightly controlled, it's really hard to walk away. Which means, as a consumer, it's you know, people always say like, vote with your wallet. Well. Like what am I? What is one person gonna do? This is not the type of industry where I can vote with my wallet if, if something's not good because there's enough people that will just continue to buy and continue to uh, purchase these products um, that their behavior is never gonna change. And for the in- the people that are creating content, the fact that I can't go to a content creator, I can go to sorry, there are content creators that don't take those, don't have those relationships. So Honest Wargamer is a really good example. I'm a good example. There's lots of content creators that just create. They, they they go and purchase the books, and they give you the honest review. They don't give a damn what Games Workshop thinks. They're going to tell you read, their their honest opinion. Those are the content creators that I would recommend checking out. Because and even if that means you have to wait a week for the pre uh, to to purchase, right? Um, to, to, then then you have to wait a week. Now the issue is, and this is actually the big issue that ties this all together, right now. And let's go back to Career City. We are living in a Games Workshop ecosystem where scarcity is a huge problem. And so as a consumer, Dude, you, are, <laughs> you, are, you either have to rely on these advanced reviews because they go, guess when they go live? On pre-order day, right? So they don't go live a few weeks before the pre-order so you can think about it, read all the reviews, and then on pre-order day, make that informed decision. You have to, A, rush out, place your pre-order, the minute it goes live right now, because if you don't, you're not going to get it. That's just the reality of this. And even if you do, you might not get it, right? And that's from GamesWorkshop.com. If you pre-order from your LGS, there's a chance that they don't have a copy for you. They just don't get your copy. So either way, you're in a you're in a mode of like panic buying. Second, because your review is not actually your reviews aren't your the embargo and the NDAs on the reviews are not lifted till that time. You're kind of in a no-win situation because you can't actually wait for those honest reviews to come out because by then you're never going to get the thing if it's good, and so you're relying. And then even if you 
watch the reviews midnight on the day before pre-order, you know, it's only those paid reviews. It's only those influenced reviews that, and so can you really trust them? And so they've created this kind of like, I don't know, it's, you're kind of stuck in this situation where it's like, well, you just got to buy things and hope that they're good. And if not, maybe you can sell it. Like my Curse City, I didn't buy it because I thought I wanted to play Curse City right away. I bought it because I knew if I didn't get it, I probably wouldn't. And I didn't even know at the time that they would run out. I just got it because I was like, well, it w- like we're still in lockdown here in Vancouver. We're not even supposed to have people at our houses. So when was I going to play Curse City? We've been in lockdown for three months. Right. right? I wasn't going to play it until at least October. Right. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't, I'm not going to play this game till October. So why am I rushing out to buy it? Well, I'm rushing out to buy it because I know if I don't buy it right now, I'm just not going to get it. And sure enough, I was lucky. I bought my copy and, and then like literally it was all sold out. So, and then this is, this is this like feedback loop that Games Workshop has created, right? Where you're kind of, they're forcing your hand. And this is why, you know, it's so hard to not, not, continue buying right it, it's 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 very it's very it's very insidious i guess in a lot of ways yeah and like well like for instance bellacore you know and that whole fear of missing out thing <laughs> i had to order bellacore online so i could get one you know the ones i got for the store basically went to customers and it's what's funny is now with the way the gw does their previews where they release stuff on the warhammer community or they tease it uh i get emails you know a week before pre-orders are even up for products sometimes now so, like, I'm not even getting to the pre-order date before I've already gotten pre-orders. And if they come back and they cap it or allocate it, you know, I have to go back and tell, you know, most of them are sold out before I even get the cap. Like, uh, you know, like, so they'll, I'll, I'll get emails from people or, or get put on the list for stuff. And then I get my caps. And I basically just have to make sure that I give it to the people that submitted an order, you know, and the, and, and there's other shops they can get their stuff out, I hope. But it's uh, it's been tough, man. It's been tough for the consumers. It's been tough for the shops. And I hope to see a change. I, I would like to see some good changes and maybe getting further and further out of this pandemic. That'll be what happens. But Yeah, and they- we can hope. I mean, um, we're seeing... It seems like, and I don't know if I'm just imagining it, it seems like the amount of releases every week is increasing. Like the last few weeks, we've had some fairly, like, heavy release schedules with lots of different stuff coming out. Um, So I'm hoping that's a sign that we're going to be seeing um, a lot more coming out. But ultimately, I I mean, I don't know what the answer is to the solution. Um, Like, I just don't see... I I think that, you know, when I mentioned before, the community needs to enforce it. The community needs to be more forceful in making sure that they're clear on who these paid influencers are. And then the platforms as well, because if you if you go to, um, say, Instagram, for instance, and I have a product on Instagram that I want to promote, I have to actually put that it's a paid advertisement. It's, it's a sponsored post. That's actually part of the rules for Instagram. And I know YouTube has similar rules, but it's just never enforced for Warhammer stuff. Right. So I do think there needs to be more enforcement of these kinds of paid relationships and more transparency on these paid relationships. The most you ever get from them is hey games workshop was nice enough this is my favorite line i always hear they were nice enough to send us a preview copy no games workshop is smart they invest jack all in marketing every year right they don't have a marketing department you don't see games workshop advertisements they know they can take a a book a codex that costs them six dollars to actually produce right send it to you and for that six dollar investment they're going to get thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of, of advertisement so they're actually not nice. You're the one that's nice for doing that for Games Workshop. You're the one that's being nice for Games Workshop. So don't ever think Games Workshop is being nice enough to you. They look at it, you are purely a business decision, and they're doing it as a marketing decision, and they're doing it because they know that there's so many people just like you all around the content creator ecosystem that will, for free, for the cost of a codex which or a box set, which you know, if you look at how much it costs them to send like a model kit, it's probably like three dollars in materials, if that, for like a large model. Like the plastic is cheap, the packaging, whatever, to get it there. For 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 like one one twentieth of the cost of that actual retail cost, they know that they can get thousands of dollars, they can get hundreds of thousands of views from some of these content creators, free advertising, and they know it's always gonna be positive because they know that you can you will not say anything bad about it because you don't want to lose that. And that is super problematic. And the fact that these content creators think that Games Workshop is being nice to them or that they are somehow special and that Games Workshop chose them uh, to be like, you know, because they have such like in- great, there's such great like content creators. Like, I just think that's, it's such a, it's such a delusion. 
Um, but I don't think the content creators like, and it's nothing. It's not their fault. Look, I always say you better like if you're a content creator and you're doing this full time. Hey man, you hustle for yourself. You do whatever it takes to make your cash, right? Like I, I don't begrudge the content creators for doing what they need to do to make that money, man. Like I want people to make money. Let's all get rich, right? Fantastic. The problem isn't that they're making money. The problem is the lack of transparency and the lack of honesty. So if you can, how do we do both? Well, I don't know the answer to that, but I know like, in, and, and I mentioned movies, I mentioned uh, hardware. There are a lot of very honest reviewers in those industries that somehow make it. But again, it comes down to the nature of that industry, which is there's more than one company involved. There's more than one player in the game, unlike our, our hobby. Um, and so they're able to use those other companies as benchmarks on those relationships. Like if NVIDIA, and, and actually this actually happened recently, um, where NVIDIA actually pulled um, one of the content creators because they didn't like the review. And then that letter that NVIDIA sent that person went on social media, went viral, and the entire hardware community, all of the other reviewers, uh, all of the other people that create that content basically revolted and turned this into a giant PR nightmare for NVIDIA, basically saying, look, NVIDIA, we are trying to be journalists or people with integrity. So when you send us a shitty product and we say it's shitty, then you need to just know that. And when you go and take one of the content creators and you pull their relationship as a result of that, we're going to turn this into a PR nightmare. And it literally turned into a PR nightmare. Guess what happened? NVIDIA reversed their stance. They reinstated that content creator and they had to have do all this damage control. Like it was a huge nightmare for them. This was like a few months ago. And all it was because the guy they didn't like the guy's review. Now, imagine that happened in, in a Games Workshop ecosystem. Imagine, say, uh, Tyler Mengel, who does like uh, Mengel's Miniatures, I think he's one of the content creators. Imagine he put out a bad review and Games Workshop pulled his, his, his uh, relationship. And all of the other content creators, all of the guys on YouTube, Instagram, podcast, whatever, all banded together and created a huge PR nightmare for Games Workshop. And basically said, hey, this is not good enough. You cannot do this. This is this is out of integrity. Imagine if that happened. You can't imagine it because it would never happen in a million years. But that's my point. That's the difference between people that are doing this out of a sense of, I guess, with integrity and like, a, like I want to say journalistic integrity. I don't really think they're journalists. They're more like reviewers, whatever. Whatever you want right. to call that. They're coming from a place of integrity to people who are just using this as a, you know, something to make money for themselves, which ultimately, again, I don't blame them. I say hustle, hustle for yourself. I want you guys to be successful, but it's that. But just understand that this is the kind of this is this is the relationship you've entered in. You've made a deal with the devil, and just be be honest with the with, with us about it, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's probably what. Hearing you talk about it, I think that's what would do it for me too. Is like if they would just, you know, if you're you're basically watching an infomercial, you know, like at the first of the infomercial, they say like, hey, this is paid for by the George Foreman Grill. And then you watch George Foreman for 30 minutes talk about his grill. You know, it'd be the same thing. Like if this, you know, this review is uh, provided for by Games Workshop, you know, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, that would be a good step to go there. But again, they'd have to, like, let them be free to speak and say, you know, this this isn't that great for me to be happy with it, I think. Because, you know, you, you're the, no one's ever going to say it's bad. You know, it's always going to be really good or it's fun and... You know they did a really good job with this, and and uh, if GW would would actually let people, you know, constructively criticize their their stuff with the disclaimers, I think I would be happy. Yeah, but, and the other thing too is like if we felt, um, <clears throat> if we felt that those reviewers could like if they actually put out the bad reviews and you got every once in a while the stinkers, because here's the thing that kill team box, everyone universally knew it was a stinker. Right, the yeah. value was just awful. But like, you could tell, and it was like it was like one of those hostage situations where it's like, it was like blink twice if this is a bad product. Where it's like you could tell some of them really wanted to tell you, do not buy this, and they beat they kind of beat around the bush and danced around it. They're like, well, you know, it's not as great of a value as previous things. Like they were they were they were trying so hard not to say something negative, but still try to like warn you that this isn't great and like. I would have just been like, no, this sucks. Don't buy this. Like, yeah. Right? Like, but like, instead, everyone is trying to be like, trying to put like a spin on it just to make it so it's not so negative because they don't want to, they're, they're worried about that relationship. And I think well, that's said, just really you said, dishonest. You said hostage situation too. You know, look at that practice. They took, they took what, four units that were in Codex that had been out for six months 
and basically didn't release the models. And then if you wanted the models, they put them in the subpar box set, you know, and forced you to eat it that way. You know, and I know a lot of people that are big enough consumers of the GW product that they they spent the premium on just getting the heavy interceptors and or, uh, intercessors and getting the the, the intercessor captain. And it's just like you know they they went out and paid that premium for what was basically a lackluster thing. You know that terrain in there wasn't even really usable at a scale of forty k. And you know the, the the models were in the codex months before and were long overdue release. And, and like, look now, we're just now getting to where they're actually releasing the flayed ones. They're they're releasing the heavy intercessors, and you know it wasn't. In a lot of ways, it was kind of an abuse of the customer. And in that abuse of the customer, these guys were complicit because, like you talked about, the blink twice or the, you know, it's not the greatest value, but it's still good type deal. You know, they they sold this bill of goods to people knowingly. You know, they knew it was shit, and they still turned around and did it because they don't want to miss out on the next box set that comes down the stream and the, and the and the money opportunity that comes from it. Yeah, and like the biggest thing with uh, you know that kilting box is like that's that in general is actually just a really rotten practice. Uh, like it, it's very it's it's very obvious what they're doing. Right, like no one is like dumb and thinking, oh well, this must be some sort of like, you know, it's very, it's very clear, especially you know, and they're doing the same thing with this. Uh, there's a White King model in the new um, uh, Grave Lords release for AOS. It's only available in this box set, which is going to be, it's like a hundred and fifty dollars, two hundred dollar box set, and it's going to be like that for six months. So if you want that model, you got to buy this box set with all these old kits that suck. So it's like that as a practice, I just think is awful. And I'm actually um, so I do I do a, my own podcast and and my my topic for next week actually on uh, a show I do called Politics and Plastic, we're actually co- talking about um, basically uh, counterfeit counterfeiting and 3D printing and like the whole recaster drama. But one of the things that when I when I like look at the whole picture of like recasting and I look at whether it's justified when i see games workshop do stuff like that like i literally had a client i, I do some commission painting send me and I, i'm looking at them right now a bag of 20 3d printed uh heavy intercessors <laughs> so i'm gonna paint them for him because i don't care but he went and he bought those because he's like well i can't get these models they're just not available so i have right. i have i have 20 3d printed and they look almost identical to the current like the actual heavy intercessors they're slightly different but they're close enough that you probably couldn't tell on a table unless you picked them up and so they're not only a ripoff of the IP, but they're 3D printed, re- like basically counterfeits. And I don't blame him because what choice did he have? He wanted those models. He wanted to play those models. I don't blame him. I don't. I'm like, yeah, of course I'll paint them. I don't care. So yeah. it, it it drives. It, it it's like it just reminds me of that whole like they've created a, a shitty business practice, and it's it dri- it actually drives people to um, be dishonest and and rip them off and to, to like do those kinds of things. So I actually think. If Games Workshop wants to make more money, they should stop that stuff because what it does, it, and in a lot of, and actually in a lot of cases, I see 3D sculpts of the models that are hard to get come out, and especially because of supply chain issues, a lot easier to get than yeah. Games Workshop models. So it's like if Games Workshop actually wants to make more money, they should actually just release the models so people can buy them because I would much rather buy plastic sprues from Games Workshop than buy go get a a, a Chinese recast or a 3D print. But if that's the only thing available for six to eight months, then and I, I need it for an event or I want it for a game, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hesitate. I'm just gonna be like, fuck it. I'm going for it. <laughs> Same way, man. Same way. Well it's probably a good place to close her down there. Um, you mentioned your show. Where can people find your show? So I have a YouTube channel called Duplicity Paint Studio. Um, so you can search that up. And it's uh, just youtube.com slash duplicity paint studio. I also stream on Twitch under uh, twitch doc- twitch.tv slash duplicity paint. And I also uh, pu- publish those as a podcast as well. So I'm streaming about two to three times a week. It's slowed down a little bit just with summer. Like we've had um, two to three really nice weekends. So I've been, instead of streaming, I've been escaping out into the wilderness the last two, two to three weekends. But um, I've been doing painting videos. I do uh, two or three podcasts and then I do paint streaming as well. So make sure to check it out. Uh, I also, if you want to check out my Instagram, it's Jimbo V underscore paints on Instagram. So you can look that up. Yeah, there. it's just some dope looking models. I hit up Jim a couple weeks ago by the Bellacore. It's uh probably one of the favorite paint jobs I've seen on Instagram in a long time. So, Jim, I really appreciate you coming on today. Uh, I look forward to hearing more from you. And, uh, 
remember guys go uh, go check out his uh, his channel his work it's worth it and uh, if wargaming was easy it would be your mom and uh, we will catch you later Game over, man. It's game over. <laughs>